Good morning. Okay, good morning and greetings from a snow covered Santiago. My name is Andrew Griffin and I am part of the science diplomacy team here at the US Embassy in Chile. And it's my privilege to welcome each and every one of you to the first session of the science diplomacy speaker series focused on the topic science diplomacy and the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This series is sponsored by the US Chile Council on Science, Technology and Innovation. This council is a first of its kind mechanism for science diplomacy that brings together volunteer representatives from the government, private sector, academia, and armed forces of both countries. The council, now in its third year, is a leading forum for collaboration on policies and programs that advance our shared objective of boosting innovation as a driver for economic growth. And it is great to see so many members of the Council logged on uh, this morning. And I'd also like to welcome uh, Baxter Hunt, our Chief of Mission here at the U.S. Embassy, Dr. Sonia Ortega, our Embassy Science Fellow, uh, and several other key players in our bilateral science diplomacy efforts. And I now have the distinct honor to introduce our speaker for today's session. Dr. Bill Coldblazer is a preeminent scholar and thinker who has made invaluable contributions to science diplomacy theory and practice. He has served in prestigious institutions, including the U.S. Academy of National Sciences and the National Research Council, and he was appointed by the U.N. Secretary General to serve on a special commission that advised on science, technology, and innovation and its inclusion in the U.N. Sustainable Development Goals. Dr. Colglader led the U.S. government's science diplomacy enterprise as the science and technology advisor to the Secretary of State, and he currently serves as editor-in-chief of the Science and Diplomacy Journal and senior scholar at the Center for Science Diplomacy at the American Academy, American Association for the Advancement of Science. Now, just briefly before I give the floor to our speaker, I want to encourage all participants in today's session to submit your questions in the Q&A panel at the lower right side of your screen. My colleague from the Embassy, Lily Bravo, will moderate a Q&A session, and we really do want it to be a dynamic session, so please, uh, we do look forward to your, to your questions, and go ahead and submit those. So with that, uh, Dr. Cole, Dr. Cole Glazer, thank you so much again for joining us, and over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. I want to express my thanks to the Chile U.S. Council on Science, Technology, Innovation, and to the U.S. Embassy. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be with all of you today. Uh, I, I'm going to talk uh, briefly first about uh, science diplomacy, sort of my uh, my, my view of it, uh, and then uh, talk, of course, about the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which is affecting both of our countries so severely, as well as many other countries uh, around the, the globe. Uh, in November of, uh, of 29, I, I gave a keynote address at the World Science Forum on 20 years of science diplomacy. Uh, but that was a more optimistic time. Of course, that was before uh, uh, pre-COVID. Uh, and, and in that, uh, that, that talk, I, uh, one of my goals is to explain how science diplomacy, the term itself, has grown in popularity over the last 20 years, first in the science community, and then more recently in the, in the diplomatic community. And to just give you a couple examples uh, from the diplomatic community, you know, diplomats are paying significant attention now to the role of science and technology in diplomatic affairs. Uh, at, at that time in November, uh, when I was giving that talk, uh, an organization that was created a couple years previously called the Foreign Ministry Science and Technology Advice Network, goes by the acronym FEMSTAN, an association of, uh, of foreign ministries who were focused very much on the role of science in their, in their work. Uh, it was started actually by foreign ministries that had a person in the ministry that had a title like this, the science advisor to the foreign minister, but it's been uh, a number of other foreign ministries have joined uh, now. I think it includes about 20 inter meetings, and they had periodic meetings. Uh, and one recent, that one recently, uh, last November, was in uh, uh, was in Vienna. Uh, 
another example just to show you how science or foreign ministers are paying uh, significant attention to it right now. Uh, the, the Swiss foreign minister recently made what I thought was a very nice speech where he talked about science diplomacy as a key instrument for fostering cooperation between states. He saw in the case of his country, Switzerland, as an opportunity for Switzerland to showcase the excellence of its uh, science uh, in support of, uh, of global dialogues. Uh, last week, I participated in a workshop, a virtual workshop that was organized by the Spanish Embassy in Washington, D.C. And I was looking at, uh, also looking at science diplomacy and, uh, and the pandemic. And the, uh, the deputy chief of mission, the Spanish Embassy in Washington, I thought had a nice phrase. He said, the, the diplomats now know they need the scientists and the scientists now know that they need the, the diplomats, which I think encapsulates what science diplomacy uh, is all about. Uh, earlier this morning, I was in another uh, virtual uh, conversation with, uh, with the government of Japan and the United Nations regarding an initiative that is an, another science diplomacy initiative uh, where Japan and India are working together to strengthen the role of science and technology in each of their countries related to achieving what are called now the Sustainable Development Goals, and, and of course, very much a focus on the uh, on the pandemic. Of course, science uh, and technology have been a focus of foreign policy specialists for the last 75 years uh, following uh, the World War II, uh, focused, of course, in part on uh, the role related to, uh, uh, to weapon systems and nuclear weapons, but also related to the economy, to the impact on societies, on social systems, and, and the, the environment. However, back then it was usually referred, the topic was usually referred to science and international affairs, uh, or science and diplomacy. Uh, so, so you might ask, why have we dropped the and, no longer called science and diplomacy, but just science diplomacy? And, and for me, the significance is uh, when the and, and is there, science and diplomacy, it's already in the case, two distinct domains of which there is some overlap. Uh, science diplomacy is a much more active word. It's one that indicates that uh, science can be a tool for advancing uh, diplomatic goals. Uh, so I think uh, science diplomacy really captures very accurately now uh, what we mean about using scientific expertise, scientific knowledge uh, to help advance diplomatic goals, both for national interests uh, as well as for global interests. But as the, the DCM of the Spanish Embassy in Washington said, science diplomacy is also very important for the science community, how the diplomats can actually help scientists worldwide to, uh, in the scientific enterprise, in particular helping to remove some of the hurdles that sometimes make it more difficult to have international scientific cooperation. Uh, you also might ask, who, what are the, uh, the practitioners of science diplomacy? Uh, well, it certainly includes now a number of foreign ministries, uh, includes a number of non-governmental organizations, uh, science ac <coughs> academies around the world, and a number of international organizations, the World Health Organization, UNESCO, uh, or certainly you could call them science diplomacy organizations. Uh, I think what you have created here, uh, the Chile U.S. Council, I can, that's also a science diplomacy institution or, or initiative. Uh, at the, uh, you also have non-governmental organizations at the international level, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, which was created in the 1970s, stimulated by uh, the United States and the Soviet Union as a way for scientists from the two countries during the Cold War could work together on, on, on common instruments, uh, systems analysis applied to national uh, and international goals. So there are many different practitioners of, uh, of science diplomacy. Uh, 
the uh, but I would like to just get three other examples, which I think uh, illustrate the wide variety of topics. Uh, uh, and where, where I'm involved now, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, each year they print, uh, they present an award for science diplomacy. The most recent award uh, for 2019 went to uh, a professor at the University of California, Riverside, who actually, his origin is from Argentina, uh, Dr. Ezekiel Escura. He, uh, he received the award because of the uh, very important uh, work that he has done actually related to the border between U.S. and Mexico, helping to create uh, biosphere reserves on the border. And he was able to do that by involving both the Mexican government and the United States government. He's also helped create uh, the U.S., Canada, Mexico Trilateral Committee for Wildlife and Conservation Protection. Uh, also, his efforts related to the border between U.S. and Mexico have helped uh, the indigenous uh, native tribes that live in Mexico and, and preservation of their of their local environment. Another example, the, the Swiss government recently helped to create an institution called the Transnational Red Sea Research Center. Uh, this is a center to help protect the Red Sea ecosystem, uh, working with the science communities and the governments for the, the countries that border on, on, the, on the Red Sea. And, and lastly, the, this morning, the meeting I was in related to India and Japan for work at the United Nation on their trying to build their capacities, applying their scientific expertise to their national as well as to uh, global problems. You might also ask, uh, why are countries interested in using science now as a tool to advance uh, diplomatic goals? Uh, to me, there's sort of five that I think uh, stand out. When I was the science and technology advisor to the U.S. Secretary of State, I interacted with uh, a large number of countries, and the first topic they wanted to talk about was how they could actually build and strengthen their capabilities in science, technology, and innovation to apply them both to the prosperity and the security and the competitiveness of, of their countries, I imagine objectives very similar to the uh, uh, motivated the creation of the, the Chile U.S. Uh, uh, Council. And because of that, particularly for the, in that case for the United States at the time, actually, uh, science was actually a great asset for, uh, I believe, for American diplomacy. Uh, another factor, and this is my involvement at the U.N., uh, is sort of made this very clear. A number of diplomats are, and countries are highly concerned about the implications of the rapidly advancing science and technology enterprise. They see that it creates great opportunities, but they also see that it can create great challenges and disruption to society. So they're interested in maximizing the opportunities and minimizing the disruption and the negative aspects. Uh, then, then, of course, scientists uh, even when countries, uh, governments are estranged, scientists find it very easy to talk to each other uh, about scientists. And sometimes that type of dialogue can be used as a way to keep communication going between countries uh, when, the gov when the governments themselves are having uh, great uh, difficulties. The, uh, and also the, the last thing I'll mention is sometimes advances in science and technology can actually leap over some of the hurdles that exist in the diplomatic sphere by creating new pathways, new options that were not visible before. And I think the Montreal Protocol negotiated in the, in the 1980s is a great uh, example of that. If I had to pick what are some of the uh, uh, examples that I consider very significant at the global level related to uh, science diplomacy, uh, the ones I, I would pick out now, I think they've made considerable progress. They've also, unfortunately, had uh, recent setbacks. Uh, first, of course, was the arms con nuclear arms control. The scientists from both the U.S. and the Soviet Union in particular had dialogues outside of government called Track 2. When there are opportunities on the diplomatic side, those 
conversations between the scientists actually had a big impact on arms control agreements that occurred in the 1990s. Now, of course, uh, some of those arms control agreements are being backed out of. The uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is actually a partnership, both the science community worldwide and governments actually helped to lead to the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. Of course, that's also had its, uh, its challenges recently. And, and lastly, because I was involved also in the, uh, the efforts that helped to lead up to the Iran nuclear agreement, uh, even during the worst parts of the estrangement between Iran and the United States, both, con both governments encouraged their science communities to collaborate and exchange information. Uh, but of course, the nuclear agreement is also one that's uh, uh, in trouble at the moment, which illustrates, of course, that politics, at least in the short run, is a more powerful force than, than science. Uh, but science can, when there are these opportunities on the diplomatic side, uh, help to uh, help to make progress. Uh, when, when I, in finishing the talk that I gave at, uh, in November at the World Science Forum, I sort of listed uh, what I thought were five of the most pressing issues for the world where science diplomacy was important. Uh, and you could probably think of them uh, yourself without too much trouble. It certainly started with science diplomacy dealing with uh, uh, nuclear and other types of new weapons that are made possible by science and, and technology. Uh, however, it's, uh, I'm embarrassed to say that the one topic I did not list among my top five was the possibility of having a pandemic. So it shows you how, when, first of all, the scientists are not very good at predicting the future, like most others, uh, but also how we can be upended by something that was, uh, uh, that was not, you might say, was somewhat unanticipated uh, in how to deal with so, so let me turn to uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, as part of my effort at the American Association of Advancement of Science, I'm the editor in chief of a little journal called Science and, and Diplomacy, which gives me the opportunity to write a, an editorial. And the editorial I wrote in, in early January was uh, entitled Catastrophic Failures of the Science Policy Interface and dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. And what do I mean by, by, by catastrophic? Uh, and why I was actually shocked that, the, in my view, the United States uh, did not do well at all uh, in dealing with the, uh, the pandemic early on and certainly has its challenges now. To me, that was a, a big surprise because actually uh, we had in the United States, many experts who are highly knowledgeable about the potential of a widely spreading pandemic. Uh, in fact, there were plans that were on the shelf. There had been sort of a, uh, tests of the kind of uh, uh, steps that needed to be taken if we found that there was a, uh, a new novel virus that was spreading incredibly rapidly. And, uh, and the kind of preparations that needed to be done in advance in terms of testing, in terms of personal protective uh, equipment. Uh, when uh, I think probably all of you are quite familiar with uh, what happened in January and on, but uh, by the end of January, it was, it was perfectly clear to experts, including many other people, that this, this novel virus was incredibly infectious there was asystematic uh, spread, and that it could uh, result in exponential growth that could overwhelm uh, societies and their medical capacities and their hospitals uh, very quickly. Uh, the, the United States uh, didn't really act in terms of uh, uh, social distancing and try to control uh, uh, exposure until the middle of March. Uh, but I think many observers and I agree that if the decision had been made even two weeks earlier for the United States, it would have made a tremendous difference, resulting in many fewer deaths uh, that have occurred. But, but the failures were not only, I might say, uh, at, the, at the political level, uh, but there are also failures in the, in the in scientific institutions, uh, the, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC in the United States, actually made mistakes in trying to uh, 
provide the testing capacity that was expected, uh, and also the uh, the stores of uh, uh, personal protective equipment uh, were not uh, as robust as they should have been. Uh, the, the United States was not the only country that uh, uh, did not do terribly well, as you, as you know, around the world. But there were some countries that, that did do well. And it's interesting to try to understand uh, the factors for, for their success. Uh, you had places like uh, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, uh, New Zealand, uh, uh, Iceland, uh, Germany, uh, e- even a country in Africa, uh, in uh, most of uh, Rwanda was the country in Africa I was thinking of also did quite well and how they responded very quickly and early. In responding early, they were able not only to control the spread of infection, but also to be able to have the capacity to use testing and contact tracing uh, to follow people who did become infected and make sure that they were uh, kept in quarantine, socially distant in time. So they were able to open their countries to, 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 uh, economically much sooner. Of course, the challenges now are existing. There continue to be uh, breakouts, which does require testing and contract tracing to try to put them uh, under control. So, so, so what surprised me so much in the case of, of my country was uh, I had always viewed the United States as having the most sophisticated sort of science advisory system by which scientific information went from the science community and scientific institutions uh, provided not only to the government officials, but also to uh, uh, to the general public, uh, like the National Academies in the U.S., the many capable scientific parts of the, of the U.S. government. And yet, even with all that capacity that I believe that we had, we uh, we did not do uh, terribly well uh, in responding to the pandemic quickly and and effectively. And, and so, trying to uh, to understand. What were the reasons for for the failure? I think it uh, it reminded me of reminded me of something that I knew, but in some sense uh, uh, had had forgotten. Uh, and that was there are other factors that are key to uh, decisions that often are more important than uh, uh, than science. And uh, there are things like culture, uh, values, ethics, uh, trust. Uh, leadership, uh, history, and politics. Of course, we all know that these are extremely important factors and often determinants of of decisions. And and these types of factors, uh, of course, can only be altered by the will of the public and and our leaders uh, in government. So I think some of the failures uh, that occurred in the United States, you could ascribe to uh, to some of these intangible aspects related to our, our culture where people are very individualistic and sometimes it's not so easy to follow a collective uh, consensus view for society as a whole. The fact we have a federal system where a lot of the responsibility is passed down from the federal governments to the states. Uh, if, you, if you look to the countries that, uh, that did well, they, they had a more uh, collective sense of what was in there, the interests of, uh, of their country and perhaps had more trust in their institutions than was exhibited uh, in the case of the U.S. So so a a key issue for me is how do we, if we're going to do better in in the future, how do we address some of these more difficult challenges uh, through through efforts like uh, science diplomacy? The... uh, and for me, as I said, science diplomacy really is a, a tool for accomplishing uh, diplomatic goals. Uh, I think the most useful thing for uh, for institutions to do is to figure out their own, you might call it their roadmap of how they're going to use scientific, science and technology engagement, science diplomacy to accomplish uh, what their objectives are in the near term, in the long term. In the... Uh, in the uh, the virtual uh, conference that I mentioned that was organized by the Spanish Embassy in, in Washington last week, uh, it, at the end of the uh, of that session, I asked the, the three 
primary speakers, including the, the DCM, if they had to pick out right now, what was their top priority for science diplomacy looking forward? Uh, you won't be surprised to know that uh, it was all related to uh, to the pandemic, where the, the, the deputy chief of mission in the embassy said uh, her number one priority was actually doing everything possible uh, related to developing a vaccine. So in some sense, we're again relying on science and technology to, uh, to help solve uh, uh, our problems. Uh, the, the second person said, not only when we have a vaccine, we have to make sure it's distributed widely throughout the world and made available to all people. That's the only way we're going to control ultimately this uh, this virus. And the last person said that uh, uh, it's really important that we're all able to learn the lessons uh, that come from dealing with this uh, this crisis, not only related to future pandemics, but also what it has illustrated in terms of what you might call weaknesses in our society that uh, will mean if we don't actually uh, take some corrective action, we're probably likely going to stumble again when we have challenges uh, of this sort. That the fact that these other factors like culture can be uh, extremely important. Uh, when I was the executive officer of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, in the 2000s, there was a very interesting study that was done. It was actually requested by the intelligence agencies of the U.S. government. It was not a restricted study. It was not uh, what you want to call classified. Uh, but the question they were asking, they picked out six countries that had very ambitious plans for how they were going to develop their capabilities in science, technology, and innovation. Uh, it included uh, China, uh, Brazil, uh, India, uh, and, and several others. And they, this expert committee that had a wide variety of, uh, of expertise and backgrounds looked at all kinds of uh, quantitative data uh, related to, to patents, to investments in science and technology. And what they came up with, which surprised the committee uh, completely, is the, the fact that they probably had more to do than any other single factor and whether or not countries are going to be successful in accomplishing their very ambitious plans for building their capabilities actually related uh, to their culture, that it was uh, cultural factors. Every culture has aspects that can be, you might say, inhibit innovation and others that can help stimulate and accelerate it. And it was only those countries that were willing to tackle a hard challenge of trying to deal with some of the factors in their country uh, the Tibet innovation were the ones that were likely to be uh, to be most successful. So, in dealing with the pandemic uh, that we're faced with uh, uh, right now, uh, many of the challenges come, of course, from the, the scientific uncertainties that exist about the future path of the of the virus, uh, the impact on the economy, uh, on what our government policies are, both nationally and internationally, the behavior of people, are they going to follow uh, guidance that comes from uh, uh, scientific experts or not, uh, and also the extent to which they have, uh, the public has trust in the institutions that are providing uh, the advice. Uh, I, I'm located in, uh, the, my wife and I came to see uh, grandchildren in Texas, so we drove from Washington, D.C. to Austin, uh, and passing through several states in the southern part of the U.S., which are now experiencing increased uh, infection rates very seriously. The uh, very few people were wearing uh, face mask protections, which, of course, the experts have, have encouraged. Uh, uh, if you go in the Northeast right now and other places, you see uh, quite a different uh, where people, in some cases, particularly if there are outbreaks, continue to, uh, to social distance. And so some of the states in the U.S. are faced with the challenge of maybe having to turn back to, uh, to shutting down parts of the economy uh, because it's very hard to get all members of the public to, uh, to follow what is the best guidance in terms of uh, personal protection and, and social distancing. So we have these challenges related to the scientific uncertainties, and we have these challenges related to what you might call the value trade-offs. Uh, the value trade-offs in this case, say, between public health, uh, between the economy. 
uh, and those things are uh, are not determined by by science. They can help provide advice uh, advice on how by having, a, for example, uh, by having a better testing regime for the virus, where you can actually uh, find outbreaks when they occur and then uh, trace back and do contact tracing and find people that have potentially been infected and, uh, and have them socially distanced to determine whether or not they're, they're also infective uh, can help control these outbreaks. Uh, at the moment, that's somewhat challenging uh, uh, for us. So as, as we look forward uh, uh, to the future over the next year, next year to two years, and hopefully we will have a vaccine. Uh, the one thing that has stood out was the incredible degree of cooperation by scientists around the globe uh, in trying to find, uh, in order to accelerate the development of, of vaccines. Many different pathways now are being tried and going through various testing regimes, but also uh, therapeutics uh, that, that are able to uh, uh, to benefit people who, who are infected, particularly those that get into the more uh, severe cases. So, so the scientists really have, I, around the world, in every country, really have risen uh, to the challenge. Uh, and uh, and, I, and I think this actually will be uh, a big impact on how scientists try to contribute to their societies going forward uh, in, in the future. But I'm, unfortunately, I believe the next 12 months are going to be challenging and quite difficult. Uh, and it will be up in large part to our societies to, to the extent to which they're willing to uh, to listen to the best advice coming from uh, uh, the scientists, how they can protect themselves, their families, and the rest of society, as well as begin to to open up their economies. Uh, only with uh, that constant sort of uh, testing and experimentation are we going to be able to get through this difficult period uh, together. Let, let, let me turn lastly to the challenges uh, for the uh, uh, the Chile U.S. Council on Science, Technology, Innovation. I, I benefited from looking at uh, uh, the remarks of the the foreign minister in Chile and this recent uh, public account of the, the the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the year 2019. It gave me a sort of a good overview of. Uh, at least from Chile's foreign ministry, of uh, some of the priorities in dealing with uh, with neighboring states, uh, with the rest of Latin America, uh, with dealing with other countries, uh, the United States, countries in Europe, uh, uh, China, uh, and also how, in some cases, science and technology can be a very useful tool for advancing uh, uh, your interests. Of course. Chile has some very special capabilities in science. Uh, the remarkable uh, telescopes that exist in Chile, uh, uh, the connection of, uh, of Chile to uh, Antarctica, uh, unique places that uh, scientists around the world are all eager to, uh, to work and collaborate with the Chilean scientific community. Uh, so, so for the... Uh, the the Chile U.S. Council on Science and Technology, uh, I think by focusing very clearly on what your near-term as well as longer-term objectives are and how you can use science engagement, uh, not only with your surrounding scientific communities and governments in nearby countries, but also in countries uh, around the world, I think is a, a very fruitful task. I still believe every country is trying to strengthen its capabilities in science and technology and innovation. We see that as really the key uh, to a prosperous and secure future for our countries. And uh, I'm also a big proponent of uh, the application of science, technology, innovation to the sustainable development goals, you know, these 17 broad uh, social, economic, and environmental goals so they can encompass most things that societies are, are concerned about. Not every country is paying attention to the SDGs, but a large number of countries are. Uh, I think uh, Chile in particular might be interested that I, I mentioned this exercise between India and Japan on trying to develop roadmaps for how science and technology can help achieve national goals as well as sustainable development goals. Actually, there is an effort where five countries, three in Africa, plus India and, and in Serbia 
are being supported by international agencies, by various uh, developed countries to develop these roadmaps on uh, what are their overall plans for really accelerating their uh, their capabilities in applying science to all of the goals uh, for the country. That, I would think, is also a, would be a very useful ex exercise for uh, for Chile to uh, uh, to think about. So let me. Uh, I wanted to make sure we had plenty of time for uh, uh, for questions and comments and, and for advice. I would love very much to hear more about uh, what the uh, the council is planning to do in the future as well as uh, Chile more broadly, as well as your experience related to trying to, uh, uh, to deal with the challenges that are presented by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I, I will stop there and look forward to uh, your questions and comments. Thank you, thank you, Bill. Um, this is Lily Bravo. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very enlightening. There's there's a lot of questions. I have my own too. Um, so, but I think we have a couple of ones that we are going to point out. And um, uh, let me start by um, saying that uh, among our audience, we have our charge of affairs, Baxter Han, and he would like. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us and to to join us in the series of uh, speaking uh, uh, events or virtual events I'm going to have. And so, let me uh, introduce Baxter Hunt uh, and give him the floor or the screen, I should say. Dr. Kohlglazer, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure having you uh, with us. Um, and uh, we, of course, have been very focused on science, technology, and innovation at our embassy here in Santiago. Uh, Chile is a country that has some unique um, uh, uh, both resources and focus in terms of the government and the private sector here that we're taking advantage of, and it's made a great difference in terms of our bilateral relationship. Uh, and I know that some people on this call will, will talk to you a little more about that. But uh, my question to you is uh, more uh, sort of on a broader institutional level based on your experience as uh, the science and technology advisor to the uh, Secretary of State a few years back. And that is based on that experience, what kind of recommendations would you have to uh, the State Department, to foreign ministries, on how they can adapt to the, um, uh, the, the demands for greater focus on science and technology uh, in the work that we do? Uh, what can our State Department and other foreign ministries do to be more effective in this space and to work more effectively with our uh, our scientific community. So I'd welcome your thoughts on that. No, no, the, 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 yeah, thank you, thank you very much. The, uh, it's interesting that the, the position of science technology advisor to the Secretary of State in the U.S. actually came from a recommendation of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and Engineering in a report that was done in 1999. It made a number, it was on uh, the pervasive role of science, technology, and innovation for foreign policy. Uh, it made a number of recommendations. Secretary Albright was the Secretary of State at the time. Uh, the State Department didn't adopt all the recommendations, but one that they did adopt was the creation of, of this position, which has existed uh, since then. The, uh, the, the National Academies followed up, I think it was in 2016, where they did a follow-up study of what more needed to be done, at least for the U.S. Uh, State Department in terms of incorporating more the expertise and the knowledge that uh, the diplomats need in uh, in the State Department. Uh, so both that 1999 report and the 2016, I think, are, are very useful. Uh, and now it turns out, after the recent experience with the uh, with the pandemic, uh, I, I co-chair for the National Academies what's called a roundtable on science diplomacy, and we're sponsoring a workshop. Uh, it'll 
occur later this fall, again, on the same topic, what more can the U.S. State Department uh, do that would be effective? One thing that is that has provided, I think, enormous benefit. Uh, the that now for more than 40 years, the the American Association for the Advancement of Science has a fellowship program by which young scientists and engineers can experience working in government. Now it involves all agencies of the U.S. government, but including the State Department. And uh, there are roughly uh, 30 or so of these fellows that serve for two years in all the bureaus uh, of the department. Uh, there's also a program for tenured faculty called a Jefferson Science Fellows Program, which is for uh, U.S. scientists and engineers at, at universities to come and spend a year, again, working in various departments and offices at the State Department. I, I think it's, uh, it's benefited the department, but it's also benefited the science community learning about the, uh, uh, the challenges uh, uh, of working on foreign policy. Uh, so it's, it's turned out to think it'd be a very effective tool. For the, for the, the AAAS program for the younger scientists, it turns out that I think there are now 70 that are now civil servants in the State Department. So it's act that came from this program. So it's helped. So, so it's something a number of other countries are looking at now, trying to provide opportunities for their young scientists to get an experience working uh, in, in the department. Uh, the uh, one organization I didn't mention, which is uh, also addresses your question, there's now an international network called the International Network for Government Science Advice, uh, the acronym INGSA, I-N-G-S-A, which now has uh, uh, scientists and government people from many countries around the world talking about how to strengthen science advice uh, in all agencies of government, but including in foreign ministries. And in particular, the one I did mention earlier, FEMSTAN, the foreign ministries one, is doing the same thing. Uh, so anyway, a number of countries are considering right now what they need to do to make sure they have more scientific expertise uh, in the foreign ministry. Uh, but I, I should mention that the major lesson that I learned when I served in the State Department was the, the enormous respect that I have for the professionalism of uh, our foreign service officers who serve uh, around the world. Uh, they, they're the real diplomats, uh, and you need the real diplomats for dealing with uh, many complicated problems which are far beyond science. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and look for, I'm looking forward to the, uh, the event this fall, so I'll get, I'll get more information on that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Thank you, Baxter. Thank you, Bill. Um, we've been getting several interesting questions, uh, so I'm going to leave my my question for the end because I'm sure our participants want to hear their answers. But um, just one uh, sort of question and comment that would relate to the questions that we have uh, afterwards. Uh, here, it seems that it's key uh, not just scientific cooperation, not just creating capacity within the institutions but also um, creating dialogue between all the parts, between scientists and policymakers, and as you have mentioned in other documents, and how you communicate that to the public. That is key, and, and it's key to solve not just scientific problems, but even policy related to any scientific challenge or any challenge that would <clears throat> require scientific solution. Uh, so I'm going to go for one of the questions, and I'm going to try to consolidate others. But the first question is, post-COVID-19, the globe will suffer an economic crisis. What could be the ways and commitment of administrations to science diplomacy, specifically on the global health crisis and catastrophes derived by climate change? That's from one of our members of the of the stick uh, council. So, yes, the uh, you know one thing that has suffered, unfortunately, in the worldwide response to the pandemic, in, in my view, was uh, uh, international cooperation uh, has also suffered. I think in dealing with the pandemic, 
Uh, one of the most important aspects is having all countries of the world sort of united uh, in how to, uh, to deal with it uh, and acting together. And that is occurring. A number of countries are doing that. And I think certainly we see the efforts related to developing uh, uh, vaccines. But I think the importance of getting back to a more coordinated uh, global international effort related not only to this pandemic and future pandemics, but dealing with other issues like uh, like, like climate change. I, I know with the uh, and, and the economic challenges we're going to face over the uh, the next uh, couple years. I think again, being able to deal with those and trying to minimize the, the damage and be able to get back to something closer to uh, to where we were before and to go forward is again is going to require a lot more international collaboration that is that is occurring at least uh, for some countries uh, uh, right now. So I, I would certainly put a lot of effort on that, trying to have more coordinated responses uh, by by governments uh, around the world, particularly dealing with the economy as well as dealing with the pandemic. But then dealing with uh, with climate change, I guess one of the reasons I have been so supportive of the Sustainable Development Goals, of course, one of the Sustainable Development Goals deals with climate, and we we did have the uh, uh, the Paris uh, Climate Agreement, which of course did not get as far as we need to go, but at least it was an important st uh, start. And the science community being involved in the inter intergovernmental, uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change uh, has also been useful. Uh, but again, what we really need is, again, more international coordination on how we deal with this uh, collectively together around the world. Uh, Climate change is one of our most serious issues that uh, that we face. I think in the in the coming decade, uh, being hit by the pandemic this year has made. Even though it's it's demonstrated that when economies are shut down, there are there's actually change in the impact on the environment. So it's uh, uh, it's taught us some lessons, but we have to figure out how to combine and achieve all of our goals: the economic, the public health, and the environmental and the environmental all together at the same time. Uh, that's that's a very interesting way to do uh, or to see this, this big issue that our next challenge is itself it's it's international cooperation. There's a question there about international cooperation, but <clears throat> but I'm going to anticipate uh, an, another one. Uh, what type of coordination are we going to go for a more loose structure where we're going to put a uh, as a first goal to increase communication, or are we going to still go through current multilateral organizations and uh, structures that we have that tend to be more on the regulatory side and imposing guidance and, and regulations, and there, there is a lack of trust in that? And that question, I'm going to coordinate it with this one from, um, from Camila Garcia from the Chevy. Uh, Chilean Embassy in Washington is how do you see cooperation in science, technology, and innovation between developed and developing countries? As the management of COVID has shown a focus on cooperation between countries in the north. Yes, I'm. I'm I personally am very much focused on uh, trying to use science diplomacy to be of assistance to say emerging countries, developing countries, and getting support from uh, uh, countries that are more advanced in science and technology. And in fact, I, I, I mentioned this effort at the United Nations related to uh, pro providing these roadmaps for how science and technology can be more effectively harnessed to achieve national goals for developing countries. Uh, right now, there is this, a pilot effort going on uh, that's supported by uh, the World Bank, UN agencies, uh, several advanced countries, it includes three in Africa uh, and two others, one of which is in India. So I, I think these roadmaps could actually be a very effective tool for aiding the development in, uh, uh, in countries. Uh, did, it, going back to your yeah, the first part of your question related to uh, communication uh, and, and trust building, 
I think one of the things we have learned in the, in the lessons from uh, the pandemic, not only we've seen weaknesses in some of our societies and how we deal with issues, but also has pointed out how we need in some cases perhaps to find ways to strengthen some of our international organizations. I think uh, uh, it includes all the way at the top in the, in the United Nations. I've become actually, uh, now that I've been involved with effort at the UN, uh, if we didn't have it, we would have to invent it. It's got its uh, bureaucracy and its challenges, but I think it's extremely important. And it can, there are ways to make it more effective to tackle some of these challenges. Of course, it's controlled by the member states, so it is really the countries uh, that create some of the challenges as well as the, uh, the, the opportunities. But organizations like the World Health Organization, the UN Environment Program, uh, a number of these, I think, uh, we have to go back and figure out how we can strengthen them, make them more effective. Uh, and also these initiatives like dealing with, uh, with climate change, with dealing with biodiversity, uh, the global commons issues, with protecting our oceans. Again, it really requires all countries working together. So I, I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of strengthening international organizations. And then uh, lastly, communication. Communication with the public. I mentioned in the case of the United States, one of our challenges right now is kind of a, a lack of trust. Uh, maybe the, uh, the the separation, the, the the politics going on right now in the United States makes it much more difficult to have a, a collective action. And they were all in this together. Uh, so how we communicate, how we build. I think one of the main challenges for the science community in my country, but probably in other countries, is how do we do a better job listening to the the issues that people are concerned about, helping make sure we build back trust if it's if it has gone down with not, with our public as well as with our uh, our, our leaders. Yeah. Uh, well, here's another point. You make politics you say politics and economic make more difficult for collective actions, which I totally believe because how we do that connection. And here's a question from Lee Ullman. Uh, and also moving the discussion from the north to the south is like, what should be our argument to government in Latin America as they face reduced budgets and likely will cut funds to science and technology? I would say the obvious answer of COVID and the lack of preparation to combat pandemic uh, does. I mean, what I mean is like he is making a comment, but also uh, noticing that the truth is in Latin American countries, we're gonna have a cut on budget, not just for science and technology, but to increase cooperation in maybe how we're gonna to relate to that. So on one hand, you have politics, and on the other hand, you have uh, the economic, and how our countries are gonna deal with that, in what level of cooperation and where science diplomacy will go into. It's, it's the difficult issues. What do you think about it? Yeah, I think one, one of the things that uh, the public has learned, not all the public, but a large fraction have learned from the pandemic is how important it is to have good science advice from the real experts uh, that in some sense will tell them, you know, that the truth about what are the things that can be done to protect themselves as well as the economy. I did know in the case of the United States, even though we're going to have serious budget problems too, but, but the U.S. Congress right now seems to react by saying we need to spend more on science, uh, we, which is interesting, the, uh, whether that will actually happen in practice. I, I haven't seen, I know a lot of universities and others are, are quite worried about the, uh, the impact on them of reduced budgets funding uh, scientific research, for example. But the, the initial response anyway from the U.S. Congress is that uh, Science knows extremely important to the future of the United States, and we have to preserve our investments in it. I hope in developing countries, they, they take the, uh, uh, the same position. I know it's going to be tough economically with budget cuts, but I think by having a very capable and, uh, community in the country and science, technology, innovation is really the key to future prosperity. So, uh, so I, I hope that uh, investments are, are reduced that make that uh, more difficult to capitalize on what science can do for uh, for each country. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, what I've noticed is even like from our audience and also from my presentation is that we've been focusing mostly on the role of 
of government and, and politics, and then the economics, but also several uh, decisions coming from government. What about companies? What about private sector? Can we expect funding from them? And then here we have uh, two interesting questions kind of relate that. Uh, one is from Jim McCarthy from our embassy, uh, from the commercial uh, services heading the, uh, the office there the, at the chair. So Chile has other issues like the drought that has affected the country for several years. How can science help on such issues in areas like water scarcity and food security? And here, by the way, we have uh, uh, lots of rain this week. Which has improved the situation, <laughs> but but that's a key question. Like so how also you relate the private sector and you related to other issues in where why science has to be only supported by government. Where, what's the role of the private sector here? Yeah, the, the private sector is extremely uh, important in the United States. Actually, the investment from the private sector in science and technology is much greater uh, than the government investment and. When I was in the, the State Department, uh, I found that uh, public-private partnerships were a very effective tool when there was a congruence of interest between uh, the private sector in the U.S. and the government about uh, uh, what they were doing uh, in other countries. Uh, the public-private part, the, the private sector was able to invest more, in some cases, than the government in trying and making things uh, happen. I think in dealing with the, the pandemic, uh, I think the same thing has been true in the large companies that I've talked with and dealt with. I think they have been much more perceptive in, uh, in thinking about uh, not only how to protect their companies and their employees, but what the uh, what plans are for going forward uh, in the future. Uh, so yes, the, the private sector is uh, is absolutely essential. And, in terms of increasing the capacity in science and technology in a country, uh, it really has to be the combination of the government, the private sector, and the science community all, all working uh, together. Uh, so I was, I was remiss in not putting more emphasis in my talk on the importance of the, of the private sector. And in terms of the issues like food security and, and water, you know, the science academies in, uh, in Latin America uh, there is an association of them, goes by the acronym IANIS, uh, that they did, I think, a very nice set of studies looking at, uh, at food security, agriculture uh, for each of the countries in Latin America. So I, I think the science communities in each of the countries uh, can actually have a lot to say in providing advice uh, to governments on, on the issues dealing with uh, the challenges with water, uh, with food security, nutrition. Uh, in, in agriculture, so I guess my 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 advice would be to uh, to call on your science community. I think they have thought very carefully and deeply about uh, uh, about the, these issues. Thank you. I have two uh, questions. I I'm going to move into more like I think private sector is key to you, but uh, and this is also. Uh, when you think you need, we need to increase communication between both, and and go, coming back to the current situation, which is the pandemic, and this question is from Nelson Campo, advisor for international affairs for the Ministry of Science, Technology, Knowledge, and Innovation. I made it right because it's a quite a long number, but and also a member of our of our uh, council. Here's a scheme one, like in designing our national vaccine strategy, we look out to see what other nations are doing. Mm -hmm. We choose a national and international collaborative effort, promoting cooperation and association between the many actors involved, research, academia, government, industry, etc. Some other efforts are mainly competitive. Mm -hmm. Do you see a way to close the gap between these two? Yeah, I'm, I, I think the best way forward, of course, is through these international cooperative efforts, and, uh, and it, I'm very glad that there are a number of those. Uh, the, so some countries, of course, are being, being more competitive about it. Uh, the, uh, the, the good thing is we have many different paths to a vaccines that, that are being tried, and so I certainly hope that uh, 
several of those that are successful actually come from these international collaborative efforts. They are, they are committed to making sure that uh, vaccines can be supplied around the world to, to all countries, as opposed to some of the efforts that, may, uh, that are highly prioritizing, you know, the um, domestic uh, uh, constituents. Uh, so I am actually optimistic about, uh, uh, that we will have uh, several vaccines uh, and, and several of them coming actually from these efforts that are really based on international collaboration and cooperation where the vaccines are made available widely. I hope that's uh, that's borne out. Thank you. And here I'm going to relate to another question again. This has been great. The questions have been like relating one to each other. This is perfect. It makes my life out easy as a moderator. <laughs> but anyway, interesting. Um, Okay, we're talking about vaccine. We know that vaccines and even treatments and the research for that, it's not just done by government itself. Mm -hmm. Most of this are big companies that have been devoting time, resources, and working at this and this opportunity totally against time. Mm -hmm. um, so th th there is this sense that in science diplomacy, uh, we or in science itself, we do not involve uh, the private sector. Uh, so, there's a question about how we can narrow or minimize the distance between these actors, how we can uh, reduce the gap between what is done in the laboratories and what is required by the population or by, by how we take what is in the, in the laboratory to the market at, at a cost that is not that high for the regular people, how we involve in this collaborative arrangement, the private sector itself, and we do really have private public partnerships in this way, not just the government's competing or the private sector competing to each other. When a situation like this, like a pandemic, it's key. Yeah, no, I, I, I very much agree. And I think these international cooperative efforts are leading to, will lead to vaccines that, uh, you know, are made available at, uh, at very low cost or no cost uh, widely. And that's in part because governments and foundations are making big investments and in, along with the private sector and not only trying to speed up the, the testing that needs to be done to have an effective vaccine, but also to ensure that it's distributed widely, wide, widely at a, at a, at a cost that's, uh, that's affordable. <clears throat> but let me just give you quickly one example. It doesn't deal with the pandemic one that I thought was a very effective public-private partnership, but it does provide, I think, very useful insights. Uh, in, in Vietnam, the Intel, this large company that produces uh, microchips, uh, one of its largest assembly factories is outside Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. And uh, Intel, it, that facility hires many engineers and technicians from Vietnam, and they found they did, the people they were hiring did not have all the skills that they needed. So Intel decided that it was in its own interest to help develop a public-private partnership to actually reform engineering education in Vietnam. So they brought in the U.S. government, the Vietnamese government, uh, all the ministries brought in other private sector partners, and the effort was solely directed at trying to strengthen engineering education, both at universities and at technical colleges in Vietnam. Uh, it was a multi-million dollar, multi-year partnership that's had really a significant effect. So, so in that case, there was a congruence of interests of a private company interested in this profit motive with, uh, with governments, uh, with uh, the university and the science community to accomplish the same goal. I believe there other opportunities for public-private partnership to can, where there is this overlap, congruence, and goals to achieve the same kind of uh, benefits. Uh, thank you, Bill. This last question was by Joanna Cabrera. She is um, a participant of the Science Diplomacy and Leadership Course uh, between AAAS and TWAS in, uh, in Italy in 2018. So that's another good way to cooperate too and, and increasing, uh, building more capacity. Um, I think we have most of the questions, uh, which are very good because we might relate from uh, science diplomacy from 
uh, the government itself, to the private sector, to the scientist community, uh, and key quest aspects of this is that we don't have a, a, a specific mechanism or or a specific um, set of guidance and regulations how to do science diplomacy because it all depends on on values and values that change according to culture, according to uh, how we build relationships to and the realities we have within our countries. But key for this is international cooperation. And in light of this pandemic is we, we have to revise how we're gonna do it again and how we can respond quickly. Uh, and, and what are the new structures that we need and, and which are the new rules maybe to play this. So thank you very much for your presentation. I'm gonna not, I'm not going to say give the floor because we're not here. But I'm going to say the screen, I'm going to pass the screen back to Andy Griffin. Uh, so thank you very much, Bill, for your time. Thank you to everyone that joined us. And back to Andrew. Great. Thanks, Lily. Um, and just really great questions. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question. We'll, um, we'll seek to get answers and, and follow up uh, to each of you offline uh, working with Dr. Koglazer, but I just want to thank you once again, Dr. Koglazer, for just a great, great session, very interesting analysis, um, and just sharing your, uh, from the breadth of your experience uh, in science diplomacy and the practice. So this was um, our first session. I want to invite each of you to join us for our, our next session, um, which will be on July 29th, and we'll be, um, we'll, we have the good fortune to have Dr. Sonia Ortega from the National Science Foundation, who's also an Embassy Science Fellow for our embassy here in Chile um, as the speaker, the featured speaker for our session on July 29th. So look forward to seeing you all uh, for the next session in the series. And thank you once again to Dr. Cole Glazer and just wish you all a great day. Take care. Thanks everyone. Thank you.